she uh, helped create and run the synthetic biology program at MIT. And she has a system of teaching science through synthetic biology, which is called the BioBuilder system. And she is releasing a book uh, about that system, sort of a companion book on synthetic biology at the high school level. And she's going to be selling and signing. It's like a book launch. And at the same time, Dr. Paul Fremont from Imperial College in London is going to be here. And he's Mr. Synthetic Biology in the UK. So the last big symbio meeting was held at Imperial College, and he was one of the organizers. He also has a lot of affection for the arts. He helped curate a show that I was in at the, um, uh, the Science Gallery in Dublin, along with Daisy Ginsburg, who's an artist who um, incorporates synthetic biology into her work. So uh, he's, he's going to, they're both going to speak, and it's going to be next Wednesday here at Gen Space but probably in a larger room. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out exactly where, what floor it's going to be on, but it is going to happen. So uh, we're lucky to have them in town, and if you aren't, aren't doing anything, uh, I highly suggest that you stop by. Anyway, without further ado, finally, um, here is Kate Red Banner, is that how you pronounce yeah, her name? And uh, she's a scientist at Rockefeller University, and she's part of a series of talks called New Science that people at Rockefeller organized in order to um, interact with the general public around different scientific topics. And uh, um, feel free to engage with her. Uh, I know GMOs for some people are sort of a uh, hot button. So um, we had a very lively debate when someone came and talked about vaccines. So um, <laughs> you, you can't scare us. <laughs> At any rate, without further ado, I'll give the floor to Kate. All right. All right, yeah, so I'm here to talk about GMOs, but first I have to do the obligatory plug of no science. Um, so we're a not-for-profit organization that focuses on bringing working scientists, bench scientists, to the forefront of education and advocacy, both through our website, which you can go visit. We have a number of really great blogs, and through outreach events, like the one you're at right now, um, being given by me. So knowing more about science, uh, it really it really improves your life and helps you make better decisions, um, especially if you know more about the health side, or we're going to talk more today about the technology that's going on. And science is really cool, and we want you to think it's really cool, too. Um, so that's that. And like you said, feel free to interact with me. I'm going to ask you questions. I'm going to you know, don't be afraid. I am pretty friendly. Um, so, and if you, if I lose you at any point, if at any point you're like, well, what about this? Um, feel free to interrupt me. You don't have to say phone until the end. Um, so, to make this talk, I did what all people do when they're going to look up something, and I went to Google. And I typed in GMO and hit enter, and what came out at me was incredibly scary. Um, I got a lot of really intense GMOs of the worst thing on earth articles. And I got a, little, a lot of um, scary images that look like this. A lot of like a lot of drugs and food combo. A lot of syringes are really into making these. Um, a lot of like labels slapped on things. Um, so I wanted to ask you guys, you know, when you hear GMOs or when you hear people talk about them, what kind of what comes up? What do you guys talk about? Monsanto, yeah. So if anybody doesn't know, I, I'm hard pressed to see anybody that doesn't know, but they're a company that has been making a lot of GMOs that are, in particular, herbicide and pesticide resistant, and that has had a lot of throwback from the community. But I think they do other nice things that just don't get publicized. So, so yeah, Monsanto is talked about a lot. What else? Yeah, yeah. I have a general question about the Monsanto feeling. Ah, so. do, you, do you generally feel like about um, like pharmaceutical companies, the same maybe about Monsanto? And like, do you generally think about pharmaceutical companies that you sort of, there's a trade out there, but like you kind of need pharmaceuticals and you understand that there's like sort of a bad or do you feel like that's totally different than you just dislike Monsanto? Or, and I totally, I don't work for Monsanto. <laughs> 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 I'm just curious because it's like similar kind of industry, but like, if you think I understand why we need pharmaceuticals, but it's harder to like, Wrap your head around why we need like a flag. Well, 
I mean, the way you framed it is that we somehow need. No, we need these genetically modified food organisms. Okay. Right? In the same way that we might need. Uh, drugs, okay. and so which I don't think is a fair that. comparison at all. I mean, I'm not saying that like drugs, like drugs are not bad. Drugs have very many uses, and so do certain, you know, like modified foods. Right. I don't think a comparison is a fair comparison necessarily. Yeah, we'll chat about that at the end. We got like a consequence of this business, so we can we can chat about. Um, yeah. Nice about GMO. Yeah. Um, I think that since the agricultural revolution 6,000 years ago, mm -hmm. pretty much every food we eat today is a GMO of sorts. Oh, totally. Yeah. So yeah. the idea that yeah. that's not fair at all? That's not fair. No. Okay. Have you seen the, the actual um, land race version of corn? Is it okay? Like, no, that's yeah, not fair. Yeah, to Mendelian sort of like genetic modification or something. Like selection is not the same process. It is not the same process. I mean, the same chemical outputs that you are going to get from that are not going to be the same. So I don't think there's a there's a that's not exactly Yeah, we can we can chat about that yeah. towards the end, uh, which will be which will be good. I have like a whole kind of consequences section built in, but I'm just going through the technology. This is just to get our like. Our, our groove on about GMOs to get our, our minds ready. Yeah, what's up? Um, I guess I think about yellow rice, the main encouragement. Oh, yellow yeah, rice. Yeah. That cool? that's yes. Cool. Yes. Yeah, that's my yeah, example rice. today, so we'll go right through that. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, do you want your head up? Or? I was a mess. Oh, no, <laughs> no, 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 well, that's good. You guys are, you guys are preempting. That's great. Yeah, so we have like a mix of, we have a mix of positive and negative, and it talks about Monsanto, which are generally negative. Um, <laughs> so we've got a we've got a mix out there. Usually, what you're going to find on the internet is a lot of really negative things. It was very hard for me to find anything positive, and very hard to find anything unbiased. So today's kind of talk is aimed to be just about the technology behind it, and then you know if we want to go debate morals later towards the end, we can do that. Um, so this is hopefully a very factual, unbiased representation. Um, so in case you're wondering, we're just all talking about GMOs. It stands for genetically modified organism. And I think a lot of people find this term a little intimidating, um, just because you use the term organism up in there. Um, so an organism is pretty much anything living. You've got us, animals, plants, even all the way back to bacteria, which I think people are a little confused about. And then you genetically modify. So I've got a nice little pictorial representation. So you start with an apple, and the apple's got its own DNA in there. Um, so there's a lot of talk about people that want to advertise if any food contains DNA. And it, and it all does. I was very confused when I heard about that. So you start with DNA in the apple. And then what you're adding is only a little bit. You're only kind of tapping on to the end. So the majority, you're still going to end up with an apple. You see a lot of pictures of you know, something that looks like a kiwi, and then they cut it open, and it's an orange inside. You're not going to get that. <laughs> um, so this is one thing. But genetic modification also includes if you remove a piece of DNA, or if you switch things around, or if you change only one little piece of it. Um, that's all considered genetic modification. Um, the real question is, why would you even why even bother? Why modify the DNA specifically? There's a lot of other stuff that seems to be going on with an apple. Why pick DNA? Um, well, DNA is a code. Um, and you hear that a lot. But what does that even mean? I mean, you see these helix, and you see all the letters all the time. If you watched Jurassic World, they had that up on all the screens. Um, so DNA is a code in the same way that binary is a code for but instead of code zeros and ones, it's code of four letters, A, G, D, and C. And each rung of this ladder represents a different letter. Um, but, you know, that makes sense. D is a code, D has got all that going on. But what is the code for? You hear it's the recipe for life and all that. Um, and to really get it, what is this code for, you kind of have to understand the cells. So you see these nice static pictures of cells, and you think, oh, aren't those pretty? We're made of those. Um, but what these static pictures don't show 
So cells are actually alive. Yes, I understand this wasn't donuts. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> wouldn't it be great? You know, if your donut replicates overnight, you have two donuts. Um, but is that how donuts? No, I don't think so. They're a little too stale. Um, no, but I mean, no one's seeing these gifs. I mean, uh, you know, cells move around, they replicate, they they communicate with one another, they have to get nutrients, um, get rid of waste. They have to do all of these things. But how are they? How are they doing them? They're so small, you know. We're made up of trillions of cells. How are they performing the functions that we have to perform on a daily basis? And the answer to that is protein. So proteins are essentially the machines of the cell. They're the workhorses. Um, so here I have some examples of proteins. So uh, this guy here, um, the pink thing is really the protein, and this is all inside the cell. So the pink thing is uh, essentially the tractor trailer truck of the cell, so it's carrying this kind of big blobby cargo um, from one part of the cell to the other by doing this kind of walking step. And the road that it's walking on is also made of protein. Um, and then on this side, we've got uh, a protein that focuses um, its energy that's um, on being the kind of exoskeleton, well, endoskeleton of the cell, regular skeleton. Um, and it, makes, it has the cell hold its shape and be able to move. Um, and so, you know, proteins, they're like, they're just machines. Um, so that's how the cell is doing all of the stuff that it has to do. And there's a machine that does everything that the cell has to do. Thousands, even probably millions of proteins out there. So, how does that connect to DNA? Um, so I like to use an IKEA example for this. Say you want to build this lovely IKEA desk. You, you went out, you purchased it, you bring it home, and it's, you know, it's just a bunch of pieces. Doesn't mean you have a desk yet. What do you need to put your desk together? Instructions. Yeah, you need instructions. You need a manual. You need a manual for your desk. But you don't want just a desk in your apartment. That's pretty lonely. Um, you need more furniture. And with every new piece of furniture, you need another manual. So one manual is for one piece. And in this case, proteins are your furniture, and DNA is your manual. So that's kind of how they're related. DNA has all the information that the cell needs to make each one of its proteins. And it's also got all of the information on when you want the proteins. So you don't want to get your desk before you found it um, in that case. So DNA just has all of the information for that. But it's really all about the machines. I mean. We say that this is going on, but the DNA is just kind of the way to get to the proteins. The proteins, the machines, are what we really care about. So if we go back to our apples, essentially what's going on is you're adding a new manual to your apple, and you're getting a new machine. And it works in reverse, too. So if you start with the machine, and maybe, maybe this one's broken, it's doing kind of a bad thing, making the apple sick, it got mutated in some way, you can remove that manual and no longer have that protein. So why do we modify DNA? Well, we want to make a change on the protein level. And DNA is the best and easiest way to consistently do that all the time. If you give it the manual, it'll know how to make it forever. Um, so any questions about that before we move to a bigger why question rather than a specific why DNA question? All right, cool stuff. So, why change the code in bigger sense? Yeah, what's that? I just feel like there's usually no questions about that. Like, I'm curious about like how permanent that is, or like what, what it really means. Like once you change the manual, like is that going to morph into something else? Is it going to spread into the outline community? Or, or are those like reasonable questions? Whether it's a GML or not. Yeah. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 Great. I, I yeah. Not, like I thought that was a general question. Like it's not my. Okay. <laughs> No, that's fine. The rate of mutation of our apple is not the rate of mutation of the chain. And, yeah. and, and the GMO will do the answer, which is even faster than the chain. So there's no reason to suggest that GMO will like, modification would increase rate of mutation and then increase the thing. And it's, it is true that it's possible for any new gluten to rest into something to escape out of the wild, that there are, you know, yeah. like, that there are moments in time where genes can jump species or jump, you know, even from. 
eukaryotes and prokaryotes and backwards and forwards. But that won't just happen with GMOs. It happens with everything. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so why? I know that always come I just meant that I don't like that question. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
we're introducing a new little piece of code that the cell is copying it the same way I always would. And I mean, you could wait thousands of years for this sort of thing to happen, but now we're smart enough that we can make it happen ourselves. There's also a scenario where, like, say a gene was already in the species that you wanted, but it wasn't the breed that you wanted, but it's just too close to the centromere. Physically, like, the, the limitations of breeding mean that if it's too close to the centromere, we can't get crossover, so we can't breed it naturally into some other line. Which means that just because this one gene is already in the species you're talking about, it's not even like, just by chance, it might just be the most people in the room can't yeah. grow the centromere. Okay, yeah. right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, there, if you get a bunch of scientists in a room, we'll talk about it. Um, Does anyone yeah. know where Ruby Red Grapefruit came from? We had a very interesting speaker that looks at the no. history of modified organisms. The way they used to produce new varieties is they used to put a radiation source in the center of a field and plant the crop in a circle around it <laughs> and wait for something interesting to happen. And that's where the Ruby Red Grapefruit that you eat in the grocery store comes from. <laughs> Can we go back to the old days of natural farming? <laughs> what happens in a case like that? You change the color, you change the flavor. Yeah. Is the nutritional value changed? Yeah. No, one has nothing to do with the other, necessarily. It can or it can't. So let's say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do really. Go ahead, no, no, Kate. Go ahead. All right. All right. So, you know, we can talk all day kind of about, about molecular things, and there's a lot going on. There's a lot of detail that you can go into for a really long time. But looking at the big picture of why we even want to change the DNA to begin with, I mean, you know, 32,000 years ago, the only job we had was this one, um, which is nice. Um, but, you know, through picking at the wolf and saying, oh, yeah, maybe I like this coat color a little better and selectively breeding those, I mean, you end up with all kinds of really adorable dogs, uh, which is great. Um, and the only way that we're able to do this is one through time, you know, picking out the best ones that you want and going over time and breeding those together to create this nice sandy color or this darker color here, or a size difference. Uh, the other way that we're able to do this is because there's already a lot of variation. Um, so if you want to pick out a lot of different coat colors, there's already a lot of coat colors here to kind of select from and pick the best wool for that. Um, but we don't always have time and variation on our side. So this was a New York Times article back from January of 2014. And what it addresses is farmers in Hawaii. Um, and what they farm is the rainbow papaya. And while I'm sure all of you know that we can get sick with viruses and sometimes we can die, it's less known that absolutely every organism can be infected by viruses. Different viruses, but still infected from other animals, plants, even down to bacteria get infected by viruses. So right now the rainbow papaya is having a particularly tough time in life. Um, it is being infected by the papaya ring spot virus. Um, and it's devastating on the same level that the plague was devastating to humans. You remember that from history class. Um, and we've got a few options for what we can really do about it. One option is do nothing. Um, and that kind of has two outcomes. The best outcome is that we find some trees that were infected with the virus and just you know, overcame it, got resistance in some way. And from those trees, we can repopulate the, gro the groves and get a rainbow pipe back. The worst option is that the rainbow papaya is wiped out, um, and that we no longer have the rainbow papaya for future generations. Um, so that's kind of a really big 50-50 chance to take. Um, there's a whole other option that we can do, which is genetically modify, help the papaya out, and modify it to be resistant to this virus to save it and kind of secure the papaya for the future. And as you can imagine, if you're a papaya farmer, you're a little bit in favor of that one. Um, so why change the code? Well, sometimes we just don't really have time on our side. We don't have thousands of years to just wait and try and pick the best papaya that may or may not happen. Sometimes we have to take matters into our own hands. Um, so that's one example of the why change the code for necessity reasons. Um, and there's a lot of other whys to change the code. I mean, that are less virtuous in certain ways, but 
this is one particularly good example. And this article is really great if you are interested in learning more about Kaya and Hawaii. It's a really interesting situation. It very well might. So yeah. the way that is it every single papaya going to be devastated? I mean, this like, entire I live in Costa Rica, and there's extra cow. Oh yeah, there are different papayas, okay. but this papaya is in particular quite in danger. Um, the way that they usually farm this, I mean, you want all of the papayas in the grove to be very similar. They're a specific type, and so that limits the variation a little. So it's entirely possible that we could lose the rainbow papaya. We might have other types of papaya, but the rainbow one in particular, which I think Hawaii is somewhat famous for, could completely disappear. Yeah, it's, it's a realistic possibility. Which is an argument against monoculture. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a pretty big argument against that, but that's that's already pretty pretty ingrained. So it's a little it's a little hard to reverse now that you've already got your whole growth going on. It, it, is this Rainbow Friday, mm -hmm. uh, uh, human created organism to begin with? I'm not sure. I think. And it, it, is this virus targeting the, the big monster ones that we normally see Uh, I think this is kind of a young one, so I think these do get quite large. Um, but I'm not sure on the the actual um, whether this virus is really devastating to all varieties or if this one is just getting the most attention for it because it's the most in danger. Um, I'm not sure on that one. <laughs> yeah, we won't lose every single papaya, but we might lose this one. Uh, and we might we might lose it well a lot. Um, yeah, any more papaya questions? Alright. So let's get more into the how we change the code. So let's go into the technology a little. Um, and the way that we change the code is through something called genetic engineering, which I'm sure you've heard of. Um, you know, all different places. But, you know, if we go back to our apples, this is genetic engineering. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be food based genetic engineering in the lab all of the time to, to do all kinds of different things to do research. Um, so it's not really just a GMO specific technology, but it boils down into four pretty easy steps. Um, so, step one is to choose the protein that you care about. Um, Step two is to find the manual for that protein. You want the DNA that codes for the protein. Um, step three, pick a new spot. Where do you want your protein to be now? And step four, add it. Um, so we're going to go through all of these four steps, and we're going to go through them with the golden rice example that you guys mentioned earlier. Um, so step one, choose the protein. Uh, so usually we choose proteins that are particularly relevant for disease purposes or for another problem that's big in the world. Um, so I'm going to kind of stack this up a little and pick something for us to care about. Uh, what I'm going to pick for us to care about is vitamin A deficiency. Um, so this is a map of the world. Um, red is clinical deficiency and green is, you know, not really affected whatsoever. Um, as you can see, we're totally fine, Canada is fine. But a lot of Africa and a lot of Southeast Asia is having a huge problem with this. And how big of a problem is vitamin A deficiency? Well. It causes one to two million deaths per year and about 500,000 cases of blindness. Um, to put that into perspective, the number of people that die from cancer in the United States alone is about 600,000. Um, so if you think of all the cancer deaths that you've heard of, um, well, that's an equal number of blindness cases and one to two million, so twice the number of deaths. So it's a pretty big global problem. Um, an extra sad fact about these deaths is that Vitamin A deficiency really affects children and pregnant women the most. So the majority of these deaths of lynxes are in children, um, which is quite sad. Um, so why don't we have this problem? Um, why, is, why is America exempt from this problem? Where are we getting our vitamin A? Yeah, serious foods. Um, yeah, what's the big one? Peppers and I think beefy foods. Leafy greens? Yeah. Oh, carrots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sure that somebody's mom well somewhere told you to eat your carrots or good for your eyes. And yeah, they actually are. Um, yeah, so carrots are one of the, the big producers of vitamin A. And people um, in Africa 
that in Southeast Asia, this their staple diet, they just don't have anything that naturally has vitamin A present. Um, so wouldn't it be nice if we could make a food for them that they've already eaten, they already plant, that would also contain vitamin A? That'd be great. Um, so vitamin A is, in fact, not a protein. It is a molecule. Um, and you require proteins to make that molecule. And we don't have them. Carrots are cool. They've got them. Um, different plants have them. Um, and even down to bacteria that have these proteins. So where are we going to get them? Step two, find the manual to make our vitamin A. So what proteins do we want to pick out? Um, uh, so carrots being multicellular and you know a little fancy, they use um, about five proteins to make vitamin A. Um, and the more steps you add to a process, the more chance there is for error. Um, so really what we would want to do is to get the minimum proteins required. Um, and the best way to do that is uh, you start here and you end up there. You can take five steps, or if we make this combination, we can take only two. Um, so one protein is from corn. Uh, you know, corn, normal. Sure, it's making vitamin A. It's food that we eat all the time. The second protein actually turns out to come from a soil bacteria that works the best. Um, and it's, you know, just one of the bacteria that live in the soil. It doesn't cause any disease to humans or anything like that. But I'm not particularly surprised that bacteria is a good choice for here. And I'll tell you why. So the more complex the organism gets, the more kind of space it has to do things a little more complicated and a little more regulated. So carrots use five proteins. You know, there are things that we do that you could probably do with one protein, but instead you do it with seven. Um, but bacteria, with their limited space and the fact that the whole organism is just a single cell, their proteins do double duty. Um, sometimes their proteins can do, you know, one job, but maybe even two or three jobs. So where carrots would use five steps, for the bacteria, their protein can do multiple functions altogether. So it's pretty nice that we can narrow it down to two. And if you add these two proteins to anything, as long as that thing has the starter molecule to begin with, you'll end up with vitamin A out. Um, so that brings us to step three. Where do we want to put these proteins? So what's a good thing to use? Well, we want it to be a food, so we want them to eat it. Um, and we want it to be something that is eaten and grown very commonly in the places that are affected. And the best choice possible is rice. Um, so why could we do what we did with the dogs, from wolves to dogs? Why couldn't we just selectively breed rice? Yeah. My assumption is rice does not have vitamin A to be selective. selective way. Yeah, yeah. So that's the real important thing here. There's not a natural variety of vitamin of uh, rice that's even close to being able to produce vitamin A. There's nothing to select for. You're not like, oh, this one's a little bit closer to making it, so I'll just keep breeding that one. None of them are even a little bit close. So that's where genetic modification really kicks in. Um, Cause it's just, it's not something that you can do otherwise. Yeah, so. Very simple question. You brought that wrong. Did you just add carrot juice to rice and like sell? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's a thing that um, that they've been trying to combat, but it, it ends up it ends up really expensive to try and ship things there all the time um, and to hit every single village in all of these locations. Some of them are really remote and. You know, they'll, they'll never get any kind of shipment. And while it is a solution to the problem, it's not a more permanent solution to the problem. But couldn't people be the carrot? Can you just give that bacteria uh, so sort of yeah, the to the of people, and then you don't need the carrot? Yeah, it's hard to So there's vitamin E deficiency in these yeah. areas has been going on since the dawn of time. Yeah, I mean it might have been better at some point. Um, 
there has never been an indigenous plant in any of these countries that produce vitamin A. I don't have to see it on now because it's yeah. not Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, we got a lot of germs Yeah, I mean, tomatoes do have it, but I don't know how many of these areas can actually grow. Yeah, tomatoes, yeah, if there isn't a crop, and some kind of crops need a lot of water, tomato is the kind of thing that would need a lot of water. Like, it does excellent in some places like Virginia. Yeah. But it's in some Africa, you're not going to have, like, unless you have a hot house that's irrigated. You're not going to have like a tomato plant. It's usually like a plant in here. It's getting harder to get a hot house. Yeah, yeah, they're water good. That's why it's too. Yeah, so, so the rest is a good choice for this reason. Um, so then we finally get to step four, which is adding the manual. And this is actually the genetic engineering step. So the first three steps were kind of planning and theory, you know, what do I really care about? Where do I want to put this new thing? So this is the kind of action step. Um, and adding the manual into cells is actually not so hard. Um, there are kits that you can buy that just kind of you follow the steps. It's like baking almost, and you can do this. Um, the harder thing is just because I gave you the manual to your lovely desk does not mean that you actually were able to put together your desk. Sometimes those IKEA like, hey, manuals are confusing. Um, and the same can go here. You know, you've given it the manual, and in this case, we're giving it two separate ones to make two separate proteins to make vitamin A. It doesn't mean that the cell has was able to read them correctly. Perhaps they were inserted in a bad place, or they inserted poorly. Um, so this is kind of the big question of step four: Did you make the proteins, and are the proteins doing their job appropriately? Um, and that's, that's kind of the main troubleshooting step after adding the manual, because adding it, not so hard. Um, so yeah, a review. We want vitamin A. To get vitamin A, we need proteins to make it. Those proteins work best, one from corn, one from soil bacteria. Um, we're going to put them into rice, and we're going to check that everything looks good. And in this case, you get a nice visual representation of it looking good. So here is the natural variant of rice. And here's what's so-called golden rice. Um, so the vitamin A gives this nice golden color. Um, but I don't know how great the resolution is. You can see that the rice otherwise looks completely identical. You could have just added saffron to that rice and you get the same kind of color. Um, and I'm not even sure that it would taste differently. I feel like there's not going to taste associated with beta carotene. So it's the same entirely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so um, my next slide is actually on regulation, if you're interested. Um, but if anybody has any questions about these steps, we can talk about that before we talk about regulation. Yeah. Can talk about quality control? So there's the state state. Oh, yeah. Um, Sorry, say it again. What part are you? Uh, are you going to talk later about quality control because you said there's a potential for mistakes to be made? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we'll get into into consequences and problems and things like that. So, how is this different from fortifying food with vitamins? Like, so I think fortifying is just a coating on top of it. So mm -hmm. you would have to, you know, bring the rice to a place that you could coat it and then ship it out. And here, and that's more expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here yeah. they can actually like grow yeah. their own yeah. food and it's already done. And yeah. this is targeted to subsistence farms. Like people can you're yeah. eating what you're growing. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It makes sense that it's all there in the structure. Yeah. And another really cool part that they did for this is that the only part of the rice plant that makes this vitamin A is actually the grain of rice itself. The rest of the plant doesn't make it at all. They um, added parts to the actual manual that say, oh, only make this in this part of the plant. So it's, it's a pretty minimal change, as minimal as they could possibly make it, um, which is very cool that they were able to do that. It's quite successful. Um, yeah, what's up? Um, excess of vitamin, you know, can take a significant size of that. Um, yeah, I don't think anyone is would get excess of this. Um, I, I read some things. I'm not sure what the, if you can have an overdose, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, uh, it's pretty much how people work in, like, um, 
with the uh, Illinois Limited style, mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, dosing a community with, like, a land efficiency. The way that these, these projects are normally perceived is that they have medical doctors going first and assess the, 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 the efficiency, and then they try to come up with a dosage range, and then they, they're testing and treating to fall within that range. I mean, this breeding plants and, and trying to make sure the nutritional value of the plants matches what people need is actually kind of part and parcel of what people in urban science do all the time. But this is also built into the... the, the I was just thinking rice is right. component yeah, yeah. of the yeah. diet that wants this. Yeah, I think there's still going to be early other questions that they really count. Yeah, but those are just a really to count. Like, I think it's the scale by how much rice is the person to do. They also have different varieties that produce different amounts. Um, so the corn soil bacteria combination makes the most possible. Um, they started with one that was three different um, proteins that you added in, and it had a certain fold less. Um, Is it beta carotene or vitamin A? It's beta carotene. And then okay. you eat it, it comes vitamin A. Beta yeah, carotene sorry. is so non toxic. Oh, yeah. I used to work for a vitamin company, and the head of the company dosed himself with so much different orange. And he walked around orange, and it's perfectly yeah. fine. They're yeah, because you're a your body. And it's like a larger point. Yeah. But it's not a larger point. Like, it's like, yeah, it's a yeah. larger point. I think who I understand that people in the agriculture industry aren't trying to dose someone with like whatever amount of like, <laughs> possible. They're trying to scale it something that's edible. But if you were, we're going to engineer vitamin into a food, this would be the least, probably the most, the most helpful vitamin C. Nothing else is different about the entire plant. They check, you know, they check nutrients, they check toxins, they check everything. Uh, it's like medical trials, or yeah, yeah. I think um, they're required to do uh, probably testing with rats, and then they also kind of do a breakdown of the cells of the thing itself and make sure that everything is at the normal level. Yeah, from my understanding, like I said, they need to be able to show that the Compounds found with the genetically modified organisms and mm -hmm. that they were like indistinguishable from the compounds that are found with the natural environment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, they're, they're the exact same chemical. Um, and if you go into the FDA, they actually have everything mm -hmm. for you to look at. So you can click on all of these, you can see the ones that I clicked on. Um, and the majority of them are herbicide tolerance or insecticide resistant or things like that. But there are others that there's a whole category changing composition of there that is, you know, a variety of other things. That's what the golden rice would be under changing composition. And if you want to check it out, um, they don't have a really like snappy website yet. Um, so this is all of their um, consultations that they do because they don't only consult. But then you can go to the biotechnology consultations on food from GE plant varieties. They're not they're not into making things short and snappy. So 
But we want you to see a food shopping around yeah. and things that we will be on. Very you now, actually. Um, so although they've checked out and there's you know up to 151, they said like, yeah, this is cool. Um, very few of them are actually in the grocery store right now. Um, some of them are maybe being worked on, or they're waiting to be to have someone pick them up and actually get them in the fields. Um, I think the main ones are probably the corn varieties. Uh, there was some tomatoes and some strawberries for a while, but I think they've since stopped. But it, it's hard to find anything in the grocery store that's processed food that doesn't have corn in it. True. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So they've started um, marking the corn and soy ones now. Um, but just saying non-GMO doesn't mean as much as I might like it to mean. Um, which we can talk about on the next slide. Everyone's taking this picture if they want to. Um, I think we'll also have it places for you to check just out. Just one quick question. Yeah. This is the FDA's, the FDA's mandate keep humans from being harmed by yes. something. So this has nothing to do with the environmental impact. No. Right. So none of this is environmental okay. impact. So this focuses specifically on the plant itself, not any of the consequences. So even though it's you know safe and you could eat as much of the pesticides, the corn as you could possibly want, probably, and not have any harm whatsoever that you wouldn't have from forging yourself on regular corn. Um, yeah, yeah. Somebody, you said this is not required. This is being done, but it's not. It's not absolutely required. It's not a law that you have to go through the FDA. But every single GMO that has hit the market has gone through it. And every single person or company that's been trying to make one, um, because some of these are universities and some of them are companies that go through the FDA, um, every single one of them has been realized so far. Yeah. What you said, I was wondering, is it actually feasible to check uh, all the molecular composition of uh, a GMO compared to, to the uh, native? Yeah. Is it? We have like every metabolic yeah. pathway. Yeah. yeah. That's an There's something called the metabolome, where you look at every small molecule. Yeah, to analyze the whole, uh, uh, every single molecule in the whole molecule. Yes, that's what the metabolome means. <laughs> every <laughs> single small molecule. So yes, so far. But yeah, it's a pretty broad. Yeah, there's metabolomics, there's proteomics, there's genomics. Yeah. You can see if the genome has changed, you can see if the protein expression has changed. This is all mass spectroscopy, high resolution, high three. But stuff that's been, this is what's been happening in the past, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. It's the exact same reason why you trust your drug supply or your food supply in general, but like you can test to a, to a pretty fine degree the chemical composition of anything that we're in touch with. And we do. Well, is it you tell the use for that? Is that spectroscopy or? Okay. But mainly mass spec. Yeah. It depends on what. I mean, there's chip based technologies for genomics. I mean, you can sequence the entire genome of the plant. Yeah. I mean, the, the Beijing Genomic Center is sequencing multiple human genomes a day. I mean, the technology is now to the point where uh, with nanopore, there's something the size of a flash drive. Okay. And you can get a sequence of an organism in a day. It's about a thousand dollar genome count. Yeah. About. But the nanopore is like two air from, but. That's technical yeah. details. It'll get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're actually getting a min on it. Just yeah, just I think. All right, we talk about it. Bottom line, science is really good now, <laughs> uh, and we can really run a fine-tooth comb over all of this stuff and be able to find anything that's wrong with the plant itself. Um, but that's where the FDA kind of stops, um, making sure that the plant itself is completely fine. But there are consequences of certain kinds of GMOs that 
are less than desirable. And these three are um, examples. We've got soybeans, corn, and cotton. Um, and these are genetically modified to be either pesticide or herbicide resistant, sometimes both. Um, what that enables you to do as a farmer is to just spray a ton. Um, and the confusion here usually comes from things being GMOs and things being organic. Um, and they're usually kind of smooshed together into like organic non GMO. Um, when really they refer to three different things. So organic refers to soil conditions. Um, so it's whether the soil has been you know, sprayed with pesticides, or sprayed with herbicides, or any other kind of chemical killing agent. Um, and GMO refers specifically to the plant itself. Has it been genetically modified? Um, so, in theory, you know, if you grow our golden rice in a place that has great soil that's never been um, sprayed with anything, you could have an organic GMO. Um, and it explains my position, and I'm pro-GMO, I like the technology, I think sometimes it can really help us out of some sticky situations that either we put ourselves in or nature put us in with viruses, um, but not into this. <laughs> so, yeah, I think I think that's that's a big confusion out there. Um, you, the only articles that you really find are all about these kinds of GMOs. It's nothing really ever about the golden rice or the other kinds of things that are going on that are really helpful that have nothing to do with the environment. Yeah, exactly. Have there been any issues found where whatever protein was now being made is? I mean, if these are plants. Could it ever be that whatever was added or deleted is leaving the soil's nutrients? Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm reluctant to say that it could never happen. Um, but I feel like it'd be hard to do. Yeah. Well, I feel like there's an opposite case that hasn't really been touched in this lecture, which is where you like genetically modify something to be more drought tolerant. Yeah. So you yeah. actually draw out like less ground water, mm -hmm. you can actually like need less irrigation, which like nobody likes pesticide being sprayed. But yeah. like, also groundwater is a limited resource that you can you can engineer something shorter, have like tendencies like um, maybe say rice that if it gets flooded periodically. Uh, and just sprout up, you know, the snorkel. I know uh, that, but I mean, if you're putting in a new protein, then I mean, components that go into that protein have to be right. somewhere. It has to be empirically tested. So, well. right. so yeah. has there ever been these? I feel like it's unlikely because your cells are already naming all different kinds of proteins, and this, the proteins that you're adding in are using the same stuff that all of the other ones are. They're using the same building blocks. It's just you've added a New manual to make a new machine. They're using all the same parts. Um, it's like building a bookshelf from multiple desks that you bought from IKEA. You're using the same kind of parts. Um, so it's unlikely that it would deplete from any one specific thing. Um, maybe if you were adding like something like hemoglobin in that specifically requires iron, but I, I, I don't know if there's anything that we would need that would do that. I mean, it might be considered. An and then we would yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. What's the science on the, the correlation between increased GMO in usage mm -hmm. and increased autoimmune disease in people? Is, is, is the body fighting itself because there's these non-normal uh, genes there? Well, none of our genes that we're adding are non-normal. Um, so I'm sure you're eating that soil bacteria all the time. Um, so your body is coming into contact with it all the time. And you're eating corn all the time. So the, the proteins that you're adding into rice, while they're maybe not normally found in rice, they're definitely found in the environment. So there's nothing non-natural about the choices that you can make. It's just where you put them, they're not in the new spot anymore. Yeah. But also, I think it's like, in terms of like isolating sources, mm -hmm. I think that's, I think for most people, one of the problems is that, especially with these examples that you have on, uh, like yeah. on the screen right now, the thing is, is it coming from the GMOs or is it coming from the pesticides yeah. that are ending up leaching into like some of the material that you end up ingesting, and how well is that being monitored yeah. in contrast to the actual content of the plant? Yeah, itself. those are two like, separate two questions. Very yeah. separate things, and how to make sure that you and get the benefits of the one without the 
I just want to jump in here because I'm getting, I, I'm, it's bothering me that you keep lumping pesticides and herbicides together. Oh, yeah. So as far as I know, the genetic modifications are to eliminate pesticide use, like the BTG. Not That's to make the plants. There are plants that make them with, why would a plant, a plant be um, harmed by a pesticide? Um, I mean, they make pesticide resistant yeah. ones. I they don't know if you have pesticides too. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Okay, so I, I, was at, I was at an international meeting. A woman from South America got, got up and showed a slide of a house, you yeah. know, in, in, in a, a rural area mm -hmm. in her country with children and a plane going overhead spraying pesticides all over everything. And yeah. she said, anyone who does not like genetic engineering, talk to me. Because if you can eliminate a plane going overhead and spraying pesticides on mm -hmm. our children, um, it's worth putting in the BT gene. Oh, yeah, and, BT and, gene is great. Right. So there are certain genes, and that's from bacil that bacillus, what is it, thermogenesis. Mm -hmm. It's the same stuff you buy in the organic store to, to spray onto your crops. It's genes yeah. from that organism. Yeah. So, I let me just finish. So that, in contrast to Roundup Ready, which makes the plants resistant to Roundup, which allows you to dump something on the soil so that it kills only the weeds and not the crops. And that's where that, yeah, that, that's, that discussion that we're having about other effects might come into play. Sorry. No, no. I, I didn't mean to like interrupt. I just meant to, like, when you're done. Uh, but yeah, like I think that one thing that people don't necessarily like say explicitly is that GMO is a tool. It's like, you know, this, it sounds awful because that's often used by NRA people. I was going to say nuts, but I'll, I want <laughs> to, to explain something that's, that's very explicitly only used for one cause. But GMOs actually really are a tool. You can use them for all kinds of different things. You can use them to de decrease your dependency on water. You can use them to decrease your dependency on pesticides to uh, prefer inherent resistant pests inside of the plant and not have to douse things with chemicals. Or you could make the plant uh, resistant to, to you know, a bunch of, or a herbicide and then douse the air of herbicide. You can use it in lots of different ways. So it, it's, it's a broad, like, I guess my concern about the discussion is sometimes everything gets painted with the same brush when really you can use that tool to counter the very things that many of us are concerned about, which is like excessive use of herbicides and pesticides. And that's the next slide. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have a question. Yes. Just slightly different. Yes. Are there any plants where they are genetically modified to grow in cold weather or conversely in yeah, yeah. hot weather or use less water? Mm -hmm. Are there any practically uh, practical crop like that? Oh yeah, I think they're, yeah. they're definitely working on that. So yeah. Yeah, they are working on that. So, um, I don't know so far, is right there any? Now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Have you successfully um, inserted a fish gene into yeah. tomatoes into yeah. the Yeah, I want to mix the results on that. Fish gene yeah. into a tomato. Yeah. Yeah. So they can go there. There's work in progress. I don't think there's like, yeah, there's nothing. Yeah, yeah. there's always the argument that people have been breeding drought tolerant varieties for years. Yeah. 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 It's just a faster, easier way yeah. to get there. Well, it's fine with both hands right behind your back. <laughs> yeah, I'm tired now. Yeah, what's up with that? Is there an economical comparison to uh, losing rice versus, you know, like uh, losing more carrot crops? Um, I think it's much more economical. Um, it's, it's my understanding that rice is really easy and very cheap, yeah. and then yeah. you don't have to ship it anywhere. So then there's the whole no shipping, so it is, which is it more economical. Oh, yeah. yeah. Golden rice is not to sell to make money, it's not to sell to save off like people's food services and nutrients. Yeah. It's, it's a humanitarian effort. And yeah. 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 What is it? Yeah. What yeah. 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 Yeah.
over there is an orange um, that's been viral resistant. Um, so this is what happens when it's infected by the virus. You get these kind of stumpy brown, sad oranges. Um, and when it's virus resistant, you get a nice looking normal orange. Um, here's the Bt corn example. So there's a particular type of caterpillar that was kind of ravaging all the corn crops. Um, and by introduce, introducing this, this one gene that makes this protein um, it specifically affects this caterpillar and not all insects, um, and it makes sure that the corn is no longer destroyed by this caterpillar. Um, and then you've got soybeans. Um, these have been in here to have more oleic acid. Um, that does two things. One, it makes them more, it makes the oil more shelf stable for a longer time. Um, and Secondly, they've been doing some testing on it, and it appears that it might lower your LDL, which is your bad cholesterol. So who doesn't need that kind of help? Uh, and then finally, my favorite one uh, that I think a lot of people don't know about. So this is a bacteria, and we've given this bacteria the gene to make human insulin. Um, and so this is where all the insulin for diabetics around the world comes from. Um, it's really cheap. Uh, it's a great way to go about it. You're going to have no immune reactions because it's human insulin. Um, and now everyone can more treatment, so that's really excellent. Um, so these are some of my favorite examples of ones that are that have really good benefits and don't have these kind of consequences that are obvious in certain ways. Um, yeah, what's up? Uh, so the caterpillar resistant sort of that means it's not oh, like pesticides on the core. Oh yeah. Yeah, so the main pesticide use was to kill this one particular type of caterpillar that was just Super into corn. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, so yeah, this really limits pesticide usage because now you can set. You can see. I think this came from somebody's paper um, that they were they were testing the use of this. And, you know. And what's the ownership on these? Um, <laughs> well, this one's a big. You know. That's yeah, I'm laughing yeah. because you're you're getting to the part that I thought you were. Oh yeah, I don't have that actually. Okay, you know, I don't like have the like, like, like the BT yeah. corn. If you grow okay. BT corn, like you just yes. see yeah. one row of your corn and yeah. replant it. No, or will you be no, 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 no. Okay, so this is the deal. So yeah. one of the big down people people mix up Monsanto with GMOs yeah. because Monsanto is one of the biggest producers of GMO crops in the world, and Monsanto has an extremely aggressive intellectual property. No stance. Mm -hmm. And so they own some of these crops and they will prosecute you if they find any of these crops growing in your field. Not just those buy. crops, any crops that contain mm -hmm. any of that genetic material. Right. 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 So, so, so these are made by, um, some of these are made by universities. So a lot of the viral resistant one, like the, the viral resistant. Um, Papaya that we were talking about, the rainbow papaya, that one was made by the University of Florida. Um, those, those three true. And those three true. Um, and, you know, but I think they're really available. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're probably yeah. available. So. so, really, as long as you just need to buy one of those rainbow papayas. I don't know, but also they're even selling. Yeah, them. I think they're just like, here, take that. We made them for you. Like, right, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody here, if you want it, that's just yeah. Yeah. here. If you want to get the papaya. You go to the store, you buy a rainbow papaya, you cut it open, you save the seeds, you plant them. Yeah. yeah. One of the seeds mm -hmm. of genetically planted crop, mm -hmm. the seeds don't grow as efficiently as the seeds made by the company. For example, soybeans. You take the soybeans from buy from one shop, yeah. plant them, and you harvest them. You save some. I experimented. I planted them in regular soil, same soil. They don't grow as efficiently as mm. unless it is grown in their soil. But you're talking about a Monsanto seed. Yeah, Monsanto seed. These are different projects. Like there are I know, different I know. kinds of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like but, there, there are lots yeah. of projects that are actually people are trying to get to these answers so that they can explicitly make these answers available to the public. Yeah. And that's part of their goal. That's part of the stipulation. Anything the USDA does is explicitly made available to the public as fast as possible. Um, the golden rice scenario, lots of these kinds of cases are people, scientists working very hard for lower pay than they would get in private companies to make things accessible and accessible essentially in perpetuity to humanity. Right. right. And you can no. engineer in kill switches if you really want to. Like, there are certain ones where 
you don't want it to produce pollen and you don't want it to cross pollinate with any other right. crop, and you can do that. Um, that's not what most of these are about. That's a that's a company specific policy, I guess. I mean, it's a choice that you could make, and it's a choice they could have made with any of these. They just didn't do it. I, I guess the reason I brought it up is because the social context of these products is as important as the scientific. And from what I understand, and correct me if anyone knows more about golden rice, actually Natalie Poldell, who's coming next week, knows a lot about golden rice because this is one of the things she teaches in her biobuilder. And she actually has an exercise called Golden Bread where the kids um, they work with yeast that's engineered to create baby carotene, and then they make bread out of it. And they decide whether or not they vote, whether or not they can eat it. Um, but the uh, the golden rice was, um, in, in terms of rolling it out, uh, turned into a complete disaster, as far as I know. Uh, one of the things that they didn't take into account was culture, and white rice is considered the best, purest. Um, most expensive, high-end rice, as opposed to brown or any other color. And when they made it golden, people didn't want to eat it because they felt it wasn't as good as the white rice. Uh, There's so a whole New York Times article. There was a whole cultural thing around it. And then also, that overlaid on it was this uproar of the fact that it was GMO. Yeah. And so this invention, which could have saved a lot of lives, has never really been rolled out in a big way. And it's, it's, it's kind of tragic. But it just shows that you have to understand the community that you're trying to help before you help them. Yeah. Well, when was Golden Rice uh, rolled out? Uh, a while ago, right? Yeah. A yeah. long time ago. Not, not uh, long. Probably ten. I want to say ten. Yeah. My question is, how come we're having like debates now, newspaper TV about the GMO? But like, wasn't it like 1970 they created the work of uh, like normal yeah. with the trade? Yeah, that was reading methods, not GMO. Oh, okay. yeah, but I also think that to your point, like. I'm sorry, I know I'm super interrupting, but I'm here because I'm trying to, and I want to know how to talk to people about this better, because it's an important topic, and I think that why, why golden rice is sick, why are we still talking about this now, is because scientists aren't terribly good at communicating with people, and I think that's like an important gap in the skill set mm -hmm. that like, has an actual depth hole. Like, you can talk about That's so much of science, but I think the government is not giving the proper Maybe. Well, there's, yeah, there's a lot of misinformation, yeah. and that's why even with legislation and labeling GMOs, you know, there's... If you type it into Google, you're yeah, going yeah, and you, there's, so there's such a big yeah. misconception around that, but, but people, people yeah. yeah, but I think people think they're doing the right thing, and that's what's dangerous, yeah. right? They don't realize that it's detrimental right. to be misinformed. Yeah. It's almost better to be ignorant in that sense. It's very strange. I'm going back to the corn. Yeah. So this corn is not eaten by the caterpillars because it kills them. It does kill them. Okay, yeah. now but tell me something. Those toxins that kill the caterpillar mm -hmm. don't have any deleterious effect on us. Nope. And no yeah. other insects. It's incredibly specific. It's very impressive. And well, birds. <laughs> There's actually still plenty of this caterpillar. It's not going to kill the caterpillar. Oh, so does it just eat corn? Yeah, they, they don't just eat corn. Um, they were just way overpopulating because they found this new source. So they were probably even having a terrible effect on their environment just by you know, it's not so. It's problems. not so strange that you would have something that is detrimental to one organism or to another. But there's so many yeah. processes in the body. I mean, and that they can examine everything. everything. It's one thing to one thing. To yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I'm sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 You're holding yeah. these things yeah. to a higher yeah. standard yeah. than you're holding yeah. prescription drugs. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And you might hear people out there say, you know, why are they working with worms and flies? Like, what does that have to do with anything? Well, we've all got DNA, and we've all got protein, and it is, a lot of it is very translatable. Um, most of what we learn from neuroscience, from development, is all from worms and flies. So, tell those naysayers, space and science is important. Um, visit us here. Uh, we have great blogs. I'm going to write one about this. Um, that you can comment on and abuse me as much as you'd like. Um, and uh, thanks. So this is places that have trained me, places I've volunteered, um, and they made me what I am today. And now you can talk to your heart's content with the questions on that. Yeah, yeah. So this is um, so you can't change an entire plant all at once. Um, so the best possible thing that you can do is to change the seed and hope that the seed is as few cells as possible. Um, so there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes to be able to change the few cells that you made the way you want to, make sure they're functioning correctly into the entire plant. Um, and that's that's got its own set of problems. But yeah, you do start with few cells. Some of the few cells you trying to make up whole plant and then use seeds from that plant to make it more Yeah, yeah. So you would go from cells to seed of cell, make a plant, and then it's just easy to keep growing that plant and getting more seeds from that plant. We've actually done plant tissue culture with Gen Space. That's an exercise. So you can actually have little plant cells growing on agar. Oh, you can do it. Yeah. Alex, cool. Uh, yeah. I want to ask about time frame it takes from concept. Once you identify the genes to be transplanted into the plant, how many crop cycles you have to run to make sure where yeah, they are, sure. yeah, everything's, everything everything's is cool. uh, expressing basically. I don't know if there's a certain number that you have to do, but I would imagine yeah. it would depend heavily on what kind of plant you're trying to change, and what its growing season is, and how long it takes to get seeds from that. And and uh, where you're trying to send it also, probably the FDA probably has different things that it does compared to different countries. Um, what, so what about, what about the, the golden rice experience? How many years they spent starting from the concept to, do you have any, do you have any idea? Okay, no, I mean, field trials are like a, field trials are actually a typical part of any kind of plant breeding strategy. Right, but, Like right. you want to make sure that it's, it's coming out something palatable, something helpful. And you want to make sure that it's coming out something in a reliable fashion. But also not affecting the other plants. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. So field trials is actually a typical part of any kind of breeding practice. And the, the, I think the real thing is that the question sort of is, is GMO that different from any other kind of agricultural experiment? Where obviously there are different kinds of concerns when you're talking about cereal protein and putting in it that you know, we're, we're trying to break down. But the idea of going through a phase of, of scaling up field trials through a couple seasons, making sure that it works well in the field, and then breaking down the product of it to make sure that it's healthful and nutritious, is a pretty, like, we do that all the time in, in science. But that, that's just kind of part of the so, so basically it takes several years. I would imagine that it would take several. I, I don't know about golden rice, but I would imagine it would take several years. Well, so think about it just to scale it up. So you've got, yeah. you know, you, you, end, you end you have one plant. Right. Okay. Now you're just, yeah. how many... How many seeds can that one plant produce? Right. And then mm -hmm. why many seeds can those seeds produce? Yeah. Yeah. Also, so, how, what's the spacing? What's the yeah. farmer supposed to do for spacing? Like, what kind of soil type does it need? Like, you have to test that stuff out. It took a long while for the navel orange to really spread around. I mean, and that you can even take cuttings from, right? Yeah. I mean, if I live in a place where my villagers and me are affected through blindness, yeah. I would be the first to volunteer to say, modify me. Through the <laughs> 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 yeah, that is quite bold to say that. No one could do that. We are obligated to not touch you. In fact, when the rice gets modified, the edge, 
Yeah, so you would have to be modified at the... Your well, kids could have... Otherwise, you just have to sell. Yeah, and it would make sure you can do that. Yeah, exactly. Or definitely you would have to be modified at the degree. Right. Right. Yeah, you know, yeah, I don't know. I think even if I'm going to be shot, I'm going to be shot. I'm going to be shot. I'm going to put myself on the skin of the people that is trying to serve about the skin. Yes. So, you have some unique, some quite nice ones, actually, that, you know, Makes you think, well, you must have perfume. Now, there is other things. Uh, there's so many people telling you this. Yes, it is unlimited. Um, you know, something quickly comes up to my mind mosquitoes that I want to find genetically. So, yeah. you know, to stop, to stop, to stop, to stop the population. Yeah. Um, yes. um, cheese producing opioids. Yes. Um, I don't know. There's, there's an equality of mosquitoes. Yeah, there's a lot out there. So, now, uh, and, and Actually, the technology opens many possibilities, but every single communication also opens. Yes, there's a lot of consequences. Now, there is very poor, poor communication from the scientific community. Um, there is poor regulation, apparently. I uh, mean, yeah. apparently, it, it, it's, it's people. Yeah, we, we didn't put it in place before we got it. <laughs> um, that's, that's the constant issue. We haven't like, thought far enough in advance to make regulation before the thing has become a reality. Also, scientists are poor at how are supposed to understand how they should or shouldn't regulate this? Yeah. I mean, it's just up to Monsanto to basically decide if the people and the scientists don't convey their views well. And also, humans, you know, we are organisms. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I do understand that yeah. people have some high concerns from GMOs. Oh, yeah. It's easy to understand. I think these sort of events, are, well, you know, obviously, there's a lot more to, to be done. I mean, um, Regulation, communication, uh, Yeah, there's a there's a whole big future to be discussed about places science is going um, and getting people to care about it. Um, What's well, interesting is if you do surveys, people yeah. don't care about wearing. I mean, we're all wearing GMO crown. Oh, Nobody yeah. seems concerned about that. We're all taking GMO medicines. So yeah. concerned about that. They're only concerned about. People. Yeah. <laughs> We're just freely into it, which means there's some primal feeling that somehow is going to modify us in some yeah. way. And that's yeah. actually the thing that has never been shown to happen. Yeah. So all the other negative connotations of it are present in the cotton as well, but nobody's boycotting genes. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I'm stuck on this coin, and it's dead caterpillars. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I throw them out of the dead caterpillars. This is terrible. Out caterpillars. Tomorrow, it'll be without mosquitoes. Next day, it'll be without mosquitoes. Oh, no, it'll be without mosquitoes. Without mosquitoes. So I had it brings me home. Corn wasn't a part of the ecosystem to start with. So how did the, the corn was never a part of it? Tia Sote, the original, like, Generator corn. We only created corn recently. We only created monoculture way more recently than that. I mean, corn care. Let's talk about it. The caterpillars, <laughs> the caterpillars predated the corn, which means that they must be able to exist without the corn, right? Even more realistic, they're not all going to die. Yeah, there's no possible way they're not all going to die. Corn was not their only thing that they were happy about. It was like potato chips right. to caterpillars. Yeah. So now they just gotta go like we just organic and have some salad. Like yeah. they're just not having the processed food. And they just don't um, live in that. It's yeah. Our yeah. right, dog is not as exactly eye really uh, shop. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, I think some of it is like sort of like when I deal with people and I'm regarding asbestos, yeah. and people have this thing about it's like let's say this wall right here was made of solid asbestos. I know what happens. I'm not saying it could be, actually. Let's just say it. No, let's say it is. There is absolutely no danger. So you take a camera, right? Until you bust it up and have all this like particulate matter from the asbestos just floating around. A lot of lay people that I deal with, like at work and stuff, yeah. you just mention asbestos, they're having to figure out like it's radioactive or something. Right. They put on the gas mask. No, seriously. <laughs> it's like, 
I can angle this best is because it's pretty useful for certain contexts. Yeah, as long as it's well sealed in some kind of just like a lightest paint or anything, there is no danger at all to asbestos. It's only when you start busting it up to get it out there. I think that's this whole thing with the GMO. It's not like I'm against genetic engineering. I studied yeah. this. It's not what I'm into now, but I studied it. But it's like all this other stuff, the social stuff, and the, the way that legislation is modifying so that, like, the whole thing with Monsanto. My issue with Monsanto is that they're suing people who have fields next door that were growing not their corn. Their pollen drifts into their seeds. They use those seeds. Monsanto comes back next year knowing kind of full well that that pollen is going to permeate their fields and sues them for copyright infringement. Which is a yeah, legislative okay. issue. It's not a science it. issue. <laughs> the same with the yellow corn. I've been on a recruiting thing for working for Monsanto, and I thought they were super boring for construction. Uh, so I totally am not into like, them as, as a structure, but I do think that like the Monsanto was sort of a mirror image to ourselves and society. I mean, they're a corporation. They're not. They're not touchy feely. They're not into like you know having a back. If we tell them as a society, in a communal fashion, like, it's okay to do this, it's not okay to do this. We understand we can do it in our society in this fashion, but we don't want to allow you to do this to people in our community, then we can actually lead on the water. We just actually have to act in a coherent fashion and, you know, affect things through the change or positioning. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. And we're kind of that votes to come. Yeah. So my thing was never going to be like, oh, my bad. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I feel bad for what I did prior to this. Like, I think if, if we look hard in a, in a reasonable fashion, we can say we value a company for this output, but we don't want to do that. That's why we're seeing. So, so, so like, like, sorry, we got some. I think it stuck out to me about the GMO course. Like, 
that is a lot of jargon, but it's not like something very exciting at all. It's like the most boring um, elementary school book report you've ever written, being dumped into the trash that maybe even another copy of the most boring like elementary school book report you've ever written. And that's about it. It's, it's not like maybe the uh, yeah. Very important about the policies of the university, like Rockefeller, oh, yeah, yeah. every one of those organisms, you have fruit flies growing and testing their eyes. Are we keeping all of those? Um, are they, are so I work on HIV. Um, so everything that I make is already completely non infectious. I select one protein for HIV and then I that one. Um, but I mean, everything we have, we immediately make sure that it's not infectious. And if it is infectious, it's Kept very closely. I mean, nothing that we're. I mean, it's hard to even get a lab to grow anything out with half rats. Um, so yeah, we're not throwing anything out. Um, and then there are there are definitely companies <coughs> like AdGene that'll keep your stuff for you. If you really want like a record of everything you've got, you can send it to send it to them. They'll keep it. People can buy it. Um, you know, it's it's a really nice. Situation. There isn't any standard policy. No. It's it's so I'm the individual investigator, yeah. really, and that's how sometimes you end up with someone suddenly discovering smallpox. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. but that's, that's right. Right. You think of how that's many labs there are. Policy. How many? Yeah. I mean, you think of how many thousands of labs there are across this country, and how seldom something like that happens. Yeah, I mean, it's it's huge national news when it does. So scientists, as a general rule, are pretty responsible. But I think it's important to point out that storing smallpox in your fridge just casually is not anyone's policy. That's no, 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 that's not a no. Way to go, guys. Yeah. All right. Well, let's thank. Uh, I was thinking maybe I could do it um, as a